On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of Public Policy at UCLA, Professor Mark uh, Kleiman. Thank you so much for joining us. Sam, a pleasure. So uh, let's um, put into context for us um, the, the uh, I guess as of uh, four or five days ago, uh, Colorado's um, uh, legalization of marijuana uh, took effect. We anticipate this is going to happen in Washington State um, in the coming months. But put, put into a broader context uh, for us um, w what this represents and, and, and just how far this legalization goes on the spectrum of, I guess, decriminalization, legalization. Um putting aside for the moment the fact that it's still illegal federally, which is going to complicate things, uh, Washington and Colorado have gone about as far out as you can go on that spectrum. So they've lurched directly from full prohibition to uh, commercial legalization, more or less on the alcohol model. And there, there are a bunch of regulations, and there's some taxes. But Pretty much cannabis is going to be a commodity like other commodities. Um, and there were a number of intermediates that they skipped over uh, that I might not have skipped over uh, on the way there. But that's the, that's the direction they're going, and we'll certainly learn a lot from their experience. Well, I, I want to talk about the, the, those, what those steps would be. But is this, I mean, it, 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 am I right in uh, understanding that this goes further than we have seen just about anywhere, I'm not just in this country, but just about anywhere in terms of um, uh, cannabis becoming a another commodity? Correct. There are provinces in India where uh, bang, a, a cannabis drink, is openly sold. Other than that, it's illegal everywhere in the world, including the Netherlands. Um, the, the shops in the Netherlands are tolerated, but what they're doing isn't strictly legal. And production is strictly illegal, and people actually go to prison for it. So that the, the shops in the Netherlands sell cannabis for about the same price that the medical outlets in California do. Um, I think it's going to be much cheaper in Washington and, and Colorado when things settle down. I, I think that comes as a surprise to most people. I, I mean, I don't think people... I, I feel like the, the, um, the, the leap that has been taken here is, is sort of underappreciated. Yeah, but I mean, this is partly the problem of legislating by initiative. You need something you can put on a on a bumper sticker in a, a thirty second spot. It's partly that if you say to an American, "Well, we're going to legalize something," uh, the model that comes to mind is alcohol. For profit producers, for profit retailers, and a state regulatory mechanism, and so that's what the people in Colorado and and Washington wrote into the law. All right, let's let's take Colorado first. I know that you have uh, consulted with the uh, Washington Alcohol Bureau uh, in in their attempts to uh, to legalize uh, cannabis. Let's let's start though with with Colorado. Uh, uh, tell us um, uh, what what is happening there. What is the regulatory um, regime and um, what steps you would have taken uh, if it were up to you? to have brought us to this point, and, and why? I guess that's a big question, so uh, I'll remind you of sure. part of it as we go. So, so, so Colorado had very wide open uh, medical marijuana. About 3% of all adult Coloradans had a, had a medical card. Um, and what they basically decided to do is convert the medical outlets into commercial stores. They're going to basically change the, the, the name over the door and not require a doctor's note. And other than that, they're still in business now the way they were in business two weeks ago. So that, in some ways, it's a fairly smooth transition. Um, in addition, any Coloradan, and this has been true now for a year, any Coloradan can grow up to six plants at home. Six plants is a lot of marijuana. Um, uh, so the taxes are modest, 15% at, at uh, wholesale, the additional sales tax. Um, but uh, in the medical, on the medical side, the prices had already been falling pretty substantially. Now, the, because there are only a limited number of licensed stores now, um, and there were people coming in to buy, they were able to price gouge the first day, and I'm sure the prices will stay high for 
a few months, but I think we're going to see them going going down heavily after that. Um, the the regulatory agency is the Revenue Board, uh, and uh, as in Washington, the marketing restrictions are all about marketing to children, but there's no limit on marketing to adults, and the usual you know you can't drive drunk and so on. And so now, now, what, what would you have taken um, from a public policy standpoint? Would you have taken different uh, different steps? I mean, would there have been an intermediate period uh, in, in your mind, or um, what? What would you have done differently in Colorado? Well, so let me let me back up uh, in sort of good policy analyst fashion from what we should do to what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. All right. So the place to start is. You want to legalize cannabis because you're tired of a big illicit market. The cannabis market's probably $35 billion a year now. It's a lot of money to give to bad guys. Um, and this is not to mention the implications best. of the, the, the cost of the, 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 the so-called war on drugs, both in terms of what it does to uh, uh, people caught up in it and, the, and what it does to law enforcement. Yes, but the implication, the, the the part of that that has to do with cannabis is way overstated. We have about half a million people behind bars at any one time for drug law violations. About 40,000 of those are cannabis on a generous count. So if you think we can get rid of the drug war by getting rid of, uh, of cannabis prohibition, think again. If we wanted to get rid of the bad consequences of the drug war, we'd have to legalize cocaine and meth and heroin. And I don't see that coming. Um, what we do get rid of is about half of all drug arrests because most drug arrests are civil possession of cannabis. And so that's 650,000 people a year who don't get busted. That's a good thing. Um, and there's certainly some neighborhoods where cannabis dealing is a major problem. But, uh, but the notion that, that the drug war is a bad thing and then therefore we should legalize cannabis just doesn't, doesn't add. Still, we can get rid of the costs of cannabis prohibition, which are substantial. Um, we can make cannabis available to people who like to use it and don't get harmed by it, and that's a good thing. We can increase personal liberty, and that's a good thing. We can take uh, 30 million Americans and move them to the right side of the law. That's a very good thing. Um, so those are all the pluses of, of legalization. Oh, and we can provide cheaper and better products to the consumer, which, you know, in any other market we would consider a good thing. There'll be more product variety. Um, the, in, both in Colorado and Washington, their product will be tested, both to be certified for, as free of impurities, but also to be labeled with its chemical content. So consumers will have the capacity to know a lot more than illicit market cons consumers can know about what's actually in the pot they're using, how strong it is, what the ratio is of, of uh, THC, which is the primary intoxicant, to cannabidiol, which is an anxiety reliever and a buffer. Um, so all of that's good, but it's possible that people will wind up using cannabis in safer forms once it's legal and they know what's in it. Uh, eating, for example. I mean, uh, you know, pot brownies, I think, are a terrible idea. There's no way to know how much is in them. And once you've swallowed the brownie, you're along for the ride. And there's right. no way to have a little and then decide, you know, whether you're stoned enough. Well, but if the brownie comes labeled as it will both in, in Washington and Colorado with precisely what's in it, um, that may actually be a safer way to use cannabis because it comes on more gently. And the, there's, a, there's a different risk about the brownies, which is that at some point, you know, the six-year-old is going to find mommy's brownie stash. Right, and that's going to be a bad scene. I'm, I, I actually don't think we should be selling sweetened edibles. There's no way to make them unattractive to kids. But that's a that's a longer story. Um, so there are big advantages of legalization. Before before we get to the negatives, let me just ask one more question about the drug war. Are in the event? I mean, in the event that um, things go as one would hope. I mean, ultimately. And it um, it basically makes the 
uh, black market for marijuana uh, obsolete. Does that have implications for uh, the um, for the for the bad guys, as you call them, uh, in terms of smuggling routes and this and that? I mean, does it does it in any way hamper their business on the larger um, uh, the importation of other drugs? Probably not. Um, uh, it will certainly put some crimp in the profit, profits of the big Mexican drug trafficking organizations. And that's probably a good thing for Mexico in terms of violence. But you're looking at maybe 25% of their drug export revenues being cannabis. It won't touch, of course, their domestic, you know, in, in Mexico, drug sales. Um or their non-drug activities of you know, kidnapping and extortion and so on. But no, I would not expect to I would not expect to see the legalization of cannabis make it harder to smuggle cocaine. I don't, I don't see how that works. Right. I mean, obviously, I guess it's harder in some respects to to smuggle cannabis simply because it's just much m- harder. More of it, right? I mean, it, it just right. Exactly. Okay, so exactly. and and so, what are the um, the the negatives uh, involved in, in 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 these in terms of the outcomes? The negatives is that some people who use cannabis use it to their own harm. Um, you know, either they use too much of it, or they use too often, or they use it on the wrong occasion. Um, it's especially true for minors. Um, you know, the the evidence is is disputed in terms of what's going on in the brain. But I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, a kid staying stoned through high school, he's probably not learning as much as he would be if he were straight. And when you make something much cheaper, much more available, remove the social stigma, remove the the legal penalties, and have an industry aggressively marketing it, and note that the industry can't make any substantial money by selling to responsible users. They simply don't use enough. The minority of users who are using enough to really hurt themselves make up most of the market in volume terms. Hmm. So the interest of the industry is exactly opposite to the public interest. You know, also true for gambling, also true for alcohol, also true for tobacco. Any addictive activity the market is dominated by the addicts, even if the they're uh, as they always are a minority of the total users. Interesting. And so the downside is more drug abuse, and the question is how much more, and nobody knows. Now look, we may get a bonus here. It's possible that additional heavy cannabis use will replace heavy alcohol use, in which case we're way ahead of the game. And uh, advocates always insist, oh, of course, you'd rather have people stoned than drunk, which I think is true. What we don't know is whether they get stoned in addition to getting drunk. It's entirely possible that legal cannabis will mean more heavy drinking rather than less. Um, And that's just something we're going to have to watch out for. Now, both Washington and Colorado have rigidly separated cannabis from alcohol. You can't sell them in the same place, and you can't sell a mixed product. So, so far, so good. Um, But the lower the price, the greater the risk of heavy use. And I think both Colorado and Washington like to see quite low prices. Um, And again, I don't don't see any justification for allowing marketing. Uh, The lawyers in Washington told the liquor board, well, you know, the Supreme Court's commercial free speech doctrine says that once you've made something legal, you can't limit it to marketing except to kids. Um, I doubt that's good law, but that's what they said. And so, you know, you'll have girls in bikinis outside the stores. And so, I mean, uh, what what is, I mean, what do we know in terms of, I mean, because I'm always struck by, by in, in some respects, how little we know about pot in terms of research because it's been, uh, illegal to sort of we, we we just haven't had any models uh, in some way right. to sort of get research how do we know that there and is what, by the way, but what's ironic is that even when pot is legal to buy in colorado you still can't use that pot for research I, uh, the, w- 
the only stuff you can get for research is from the, the University of Mississippi lab, which is not very much like the stuff that's actually on the market these days. So it's it's against the law in Colorado to do research with pot that you buy in Colorado, or it's, it's not against it's not against the Colorado law, but it's against the federal law. Remember, right. it's still illegal federally. And if you went to your human subjects committee, your institutional review board, and said, uh, you know, I'm going to buy some pot on the market and and use it for research, they're going to say, no, you're not. The FDA won't allow, won't allow it. Wow. That uh, that yeah no that. That is, a, that is a piece of stupidity in federal policy that needs to be fixed. And how do we know that, um, I mean, maybe it's just simply basic economics, but how do we know that the uh, lowering of the cost of, of pot will uh, increase um, uh, a, a abuse of pot? I mean, you know, because it... You know, we were just uh, talking in the office, you know, that as uh, you know, and, and I was a kid, you know, a long time ago, uh, we're talking 30 years plus. But it was easier for me to get pot in high school than it was alcohol. Um, how how do know, we... I, I keep hearing I keep hearing say that I keep hearing people say that and I keep looking at the data that something like 90 percent of, of high school seniors have had alcohol. And I just wonder how hard it could be to get when it's in your mommy's liquor cabinet. And when, you know, every liquor store has a drunk outside who will go in and buy you a six-pack in return for keeping one of the bottles. I mean, My dad would put, like, lines on the bottles. I mean, it was... I, <laughs> but, well, but, but I imagine not everybody was, 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 uh, was, was so uh, diligent. I mean, it, I, that's, I guess, what I'm asking. Is that, I mean, do we have... Um, has there been substantial research on that? I mean, as you say, it's, it's Econ 101 that when price goes down, consumption goes up, right? That's the law of demand. It's the best best verified generalization in all of the social sciences. Um, the key fact, but, you know, I mean, if it doesn't very much matter very much to people who smoke a little because it's a pretty, it's a pretty cheap intoxicant. Think about it. If you're a naive cannabis user, um, you know, uh, a tenth of a gram of the stuff that now sells for 10 bucks a gram will get you nicely stoned. So that's, you know, a dollar for a couple of hours of intoxication. It's a much better deal than beer. So if that price goes down a little bit, it probably doesn't matter very much to the casual user. But the for... person who's got a tolerance and is using three grams a day Cannabis is now an important part of his personal budget. And so a price, in, price decrease is going gonna, is gonna to increase heavy use. The other place it matters is to kids who don't have much disposable income. Right. So all the studies I know suggest that marijuana is somewhat price elastic. Um, and you know, we'll see. Now, there is, again, there's a bonus that might be coming. Particularly young people who smoke a lot of pot often finance it by selling illegally. And legalization will take away that market. And so some of those people may, may have to smoke less because they can't afford it. But let's note that in Colorado and Washington, it's illegal to sell cannabis to anybody under 21. So about 20 to 25 percent of the cannabis market is reserved for illegal transactions. I'm hoping that as for alcohol, that'll mostly be diversion from the legal market. You know, people buying it legally and then, you know, giving it or selling it to, to minors. Because the alternative is the black market keeps running. Right. And so, um, so, so now that we've sort of identified the uh, both the positive and negative uh, outcomes that we want from a policy, what? What would you have done different in the case of Colorado? And I guess this also speaks to what you, um, uh, to a certain extent, what you consulted uh, Washington State. What, 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 what would be a better way to achieve the positives without the negatives? Right. So what you'd like to see is high prices. I see no benefit from letting prices fall. You'd like to see good consumer information. 
you know, about the chemical content and about what that means psychologically. And the problem is, again, the science hasn't really been done enough. Um, but I'd like the people selling cannabis to act more and have the training more like pharmacists than like bartenders. So it's uh, cannabis is a more complicated drug than beer. Right? Beer has a single active agent in it, and you know how much. Cannabis has at least three and maybe 50 active agents. Um, uh, I'd like to have limits on marketing. I mean, in my view, there's no reason to let the sellers do anything but have a website that you know gives the chemical content. Um, and you want to keep the price high. And in order to avoid the situation where you've got sellers who are trying to make money by creating more drug abuse, you might want to have a non-commercial business. You could you could limit it to not-for-profits, or you could have state stores. Now, you couldn't have state stores right now because the state government can't have its employees commit federal felonies, which selling pot still is. But that's the direction I'd like to see it go in. Um, the The radical idea... Um, that I'm putting out there uh, is why not have everybody who's a cannabis buyer uh, set a personal quota? All right, so you come in, you I mean, you might want to say, in order to be, become a cannabis buyer, you have to pass a test, like a driving test, just so people have memorized some facts. All right, Mr. Cedar, congratulations. You know, you've passed your, your test. We're now signing you up as a cannabis buyer in Colorado. Um, as you remember from the test, the joint contains about 40 milligrams of THC. How many of those would you like to use every month? And we're going to set that as your personal quota. And every time you buy, it'll be taken off your quota. And if you've used up your quota for the month, the guy at the cannabis store will say, sorry, Mr. Cedar, can't sell you anymore this month. If you want to raise your limit, you can. But that doesn't take effect for two weeks. So this is a, a simple nudge strategy, asking people to make a long-term plan about their cannabis use that will control their short-term behavior. It won't help everybody. I imagine but some I, I I got to imagine though that I wouldn't be terribly comfortable with somebody having that data. You know, I mean, because I, I, you know, at one point it becomes. Damn, I'm sorry. To- I'm sorry to tell you, Visa already has that data. Visa does. Right. Yeah, of course they do. Uh, I, I would probably buy with cash. <laughs> I mean, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, to the extent that, I mean, you know, if, if I but, thought... But, 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 but you're assuming that cannabis use is somehow problematic. It's now illegal activity. Well, I'm not sure, frankly, I would want a potential employer to say, hey, you know, I've been noticed you, you drink a lot of tequila. Or um, oh, no, 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 look, obviously, obviously you'd want to privacy protect that information. Right. Right, and put it under HIPAA rules. Um, I mean, enough. I can imagine problems with it, but the advantage of making people more mindful about how much cannabis they're using and allowing them to make a determination, you know, when they're not in the heat of the moment about how much they want to use. I mean, look, all I know is if if I had to choose my monthly diet at the beginning of the month, I'd weigh less. Yes, I mean, but that's also an argument maybe for that as well, right? I mean... I mean no, no, because you, you can't do it for food. I mean, food is too integrated into other things. I mean, I just can't imagine a system for actually doing that. Right. But, but cannabis is, you know, it's fairly straightforward. And yes, I do it for alcohol too. Right. Sweden used to have used to have an alcohol quota. Not users yet. Um, and when they got rid of it, you know, alcohol abuse went up, naturally. And so, and in terms of um, uh, maintaining the uh, the price of uh, cannabis, you would obviously do this through uh, taxation. In fact, I mean, I think, you know... You can, some do, you can, do, it through, you can do it through, tax, through, through taxation. You can do it, the equivalent, through quantity limitation. Right, if you if you issue license to grow only a certain amount to maintain uh, sort of a curb on supply. 
Right. Um, or you could have state stores and simply you know do it as profit rather than tax. And um, it, I mean, it, it seems that the sort of the dilemma here is that. And, and this, I guess, speaks to why you are uh, concerned about referendum driving this as opposed to sort of uh, sensible policy is that um, the, the it, it creates this sort of vacuum where uh, it's almost the difference between letting the cows run through the street, you know, the, the, the town and develop the streets rather than having uh, the, 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 the municipal government sort of say, here's a, a grid which is going to make it a lot smarter right. for our transportation. Right. Though, as somebody pointed out, Boston is a more livable city than Washington because cows are better at urban design than Frenchmen. <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go. Um, but that's not the, the case uh, in your mind when it comes to um, uh, the, the legalization of, of cannabis. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I certainly think it ought to be done on an experimental basis, and nothing I just said... Um, should overrule the experience we actually uh, have. But yeah, I think I don't think there's any reason to imagine that uh, unrestricted profit maximization uh, is going to get us the best outcome uh, for any activity where a substantial number of people wind up not doing what they really want to do. I mean, if you if you make the the really kind of one on one assumption that everybody does exactly what will maximize his own welfare, then full legalization follows automatically. But I just don't think that's a sensible thing to say about abusable drugs. And so, uh, give me your sense of I mean, so basically, what we have here is 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 two uh, experiments: uh, Colorado and Washington. And to a certain extent, what I'm hearing you say is that we've just got to sort of wait and see how this plays out. Um, what um, just based on, uh, you know, and, and part of this obviously is just sort of based on your experience and your study. But uh, give me a sense of where you think things are going to lead to in Colorado and then sort of contrast that with where you think they're going to lead to in Washington. Uh, I don't think the differences between Colorado and Washington are substantial to start with. I think eventually Colorado's prices are going to be substantially lower. Uh, well, are going to be noticeably lower. Um, one thing you're worried about in both states is that if the prices fall low enough, uh, you could wind up having people buy at retail in Colorado for export to other states. I'm not too worried about diversion from the licensed producers. I think that's reasonably easy to control. But if the fr price falls so low that retail in Colorado is below California wholesale. Then you could have pot dealers from across the country simply organizing teams of people in Colorado to buy an ounce at a time. Um, other than that, I think they're, they're pretty similar. Uh, and again, I don't, I mean, I'd like to see other approaches uh, tried as well. But I don't think there are going to be any very bad consequences in the first couple of years, right? I mean, if, if the things I'm worried about happen, they're going to happen relatively slowly. And so I think a year from now, two years from now, uh, you know, Colorado and Washington look, are going to look pretty good, and the trend in public opinion is for legalization anyway. So I doubt that the country is going to wait to you know, get long-term results from those two before plunging ahead. I think California is very likely to legalize in 2016. And so, Again, and are you concerned that there's going to be a certain sort of uh, uh, headlong rush into this, or are we, is this a net positive ultimately? Uh, well, what, I, what I'm saying now is prohibition is probably the worst way to deal with cannabis. And alcohol style commercial legalization with modest taxes and regulations may well be the second worst. And what I'm worried about is that we're going to get locked into the alcohol model in one state after another. And when Congress finally gets around to legalizing at the federal level, which I'm predicting sometime in Hillary Clinton's second term. Um, there's a lot of predictions. That's the model there. of that. <laughs> that's, hmm? that's, there's a lot of predictions in that one prediction, but go ahead. 
um, uh, we're going to be locked into the alcohol model, and we're just going to wind up with another greedy, aggressive industry that generates as much drug abuse as it can and resists all attempts at effective taxation and regulation. And by that point, their lobby, uh, and we're talking about sort of a, a, a corporate uh, commodity lobby, is going to be strong enough to prevent um, any type of sort of reasonable, almost retroactive um, right. uh, regridding of the streets, as it were. Um, right. That's, that's what I'm worried about. And also, of course, you know, sort of the libertarian impulse. You know, you're, going to have, you're going to have Republicans when they switch their position on cannabis legalization, lurch directly from you should go to jail from selling it to don't interfere with the free market. Right, we already saw that in Colorado. The Republicans in the legislature were arguing for lower cannabis taxes. Right. And, um, and so... So I this mean, is not the political atmosphere in which the stuff I want is going to be easy to, to do. And so if you were to sort of, uh, I mean, I guess the, the uh, from, a, I guess, a, a policy standpoint, it seems to me that you would advocate the sort of the federal government getting out in front of this um, and creating a, uh, a regulatory regime that is going to prevent what you perceive to be some of these pitfalls. Right. So, so one version of this is you could leave the federal law in place and have a system of policy waivers the way they did welfare reform. You know, if your state wants to have something other than marijuana prohibition, come to the Attorney General, explain what you're going to do to control drug abuse. And, you know, if it looks like a reasonable system, then the Attorney General can give you, your state a waiver from the federal law. And then what goes on in the state is actually legal at the federal level. And have that be pretty tight. And that would solve problems like... Right now, people who are in the cannabis business can't have bank accounts because the banks can't deal with them because it's criminal income. Um, so I think we need to deal with the federalism problem. And yes, in dealing with the federalism problem, we might put some fairly tight restrictions. And there's sort of a de facto, sort of a much messier, not as effective relationship between the federal government in Colorado and Washington now, right, to that effect, right, where the where uh, the DOJ said, look, I mean, here's our just sort of broad, loose parameters, but it really had more to do with sort of interstate, um, uh, I guess, importation uh, or, and... and right, the, so they're worried about interstate, organized crime, weapons, money laundering, access to kids, drunk driving. That's not the full list, but that's pretty close. The problem is they waited for Colorado and, and Washington to set up their policies, and then they issued the memo. There was no negotiation that I know about. Um, and a number of things that I would have asked for from the states you know, never got on the table. I mean, they didn't say, for example, we're going to tolerate this as long as the price doesn't fall more than 20% below the illicit price, which I think is a very important objective, not on DOJ's radar at all. Uh, nothing about marketing restrictions. Um, and so in, in terms of price, you would want the price to, uh, to be maintained at a level that, that still makes it um, uh, an, an issue as to abuse, but not so high as to make the black market continue it to be viable. Right. And um, I think that the quality advantages in the illicit market will be great enough so that it can compete very well with the black market on an equal price basis. Uh, I think it would be very very hard to sell black market weed uh, in competition with stuff that's tested and labeled. Um, and I also think that, that it looks to me in Washington and Colorado as if the trend is going to be toward concentrates rather than toward herbal. And you know, the concentrates are a little, little more complicated to produce on the, on the illicit market. Well, what do you mean so, by yeah, concentrates? Think, like uh, tinterns? Is that, uh, or uh, what is that? What, uh, 
I mean, I, you know, I have friends from California, and so I'm aware of things like, um, like those strips that you, that, like the, the, like the, the breath strips, but apparently they have it now for marijuana or yeah. like, uh, like a marijuana essential oil or something. You take a drop uh, right. with a droplet. Right, exactly. And, and, and those, and the, the liquids can be put in uh, vaporizers. You know, like e-cigarettes, um, and so you're not burning anything. Uh, and I think that that's got enough advantages, so that seems to be gr- growing in market share. Uh, and that's that's a product that the illicit market is not going to do very well with. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think wiping out the illicit market is not very hard, particularly if you do some enforcement. Interesting, uh, and therefore I wouldn't wouldn't want the listed price to fall very much. So um, uh, we can, uh, I guess, we're looking uh, somewhere around twenty twenty two in your estimation as to um, the, uh, the the federal government um, uh, legalizing it as well, and by that point uh, we could have half a dozen twenty states that have legalized it. Um, yeah, well, I mean, as, 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 as Heisenberg and Yogi Berra both said, predictions are dangerous, especially right. about the future. But yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, I was saying, if the trends in public opinion continue, we're likely to get national legalization in, in 10 years. Now, given the, you know, the latest polling, I have to say, unless something comes along to dramatically reverse the trend in public opinion, we're going to legalize, and I don't, and I don't see what that's going to be. Can I just ask you, just like in general? I mean, uh, uh, finally, what like what is what has changed? I mean, I I, I seem to remember that during uh, Jimmy Carter's era, there was a sense that uh, marijuana was going to be legalized. Was it basically just the Reagans? That that that, I mean, why has it taken so long, or why is it happening now? Well, so there was a dramatic reversal uh, sort of at the end of the Carter administration. Uh, There had been a strong trend toward decriminalization, not legalization, but a strong trend with the president behind it. Um, And then Peter Bourne's misadventures as as White House drugs are, plus the survey uh, that showed that more than 10% of high school seniors were getting stoned every day. and a generally conservative wave um, led the Carter administration to reverse itself on cannabis. Mm. And then Dan Reagan came in, and we were just saying no. Um, partly, I think, cannabis got caught up in concerns about other drugs. Partly, it got, got caught up in concern about crime. Um, partly, it just got, it got caught up in, in the backlash against hippieism, if you will. Um, and as to what's happening now, it's partly generational. You know, the, the, the opposition to cannabis legalization has always been strongest in the generations that didn't ever use it. And those generations are now a smaller and smaller fraction of the voting base. It's also true that the boomer generation was pro-pot when we were in college, or you know, the equivalent age, got to be anti-pot when we had kids, and now the kids are out of the house. Hmm. Um, what's interesting is that the the subsequent generations are strongly pro-pot, even if they've got kids at home. And again, it's really not so much pro-pot as it's anti-prohibition. Right. Part of what's happened is the, the, the market's grown. I think a lot of people are saying more or less what I'm saying, which is, you know, cannabis prohibition may have been an experiment worth trying, but it's broken down. I mean, the way alcohol prohibition broke down. Uh, and so even if you think that a big increase in pot consumption is a likely consequence of legalization and a bad thing, you could still look around and say, look, this, this is not sustainable. And in fact, that seems to be where public opinion is not so much pro-pot as anti-prohibition. Professor Mark Kleiman of uh, UCLA, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate the time. Sam, it's always fun. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.